This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. How to come up with an idea, research an idea, write the story, and market it. Hannah Horch made all the right moves, so listen up. Hannah runs a school in Memphis, Tennessee, coaching and supporting teachers. She's been a closet writer, her words, since she was the editor for her high school newspaper and won journalism awards in college. Now that her kids are grown, she's finally the author of her first book. It's entitled Enchanting Beauties, and enchanting it is. You know, I researched for a year about the Great Depression, and I actually became really fascinated with female photographers from that era. And that's what gave me the idea for the main character. But the scenes are historically accurate in terms of what's going on in the Depression. There are hobos and the Dust Bowl and all of these things, these fascinating little things. And I wove those into the story. The setting is Brownsville, Tennessee, and I lived there for four years. And come to find out, there was a, an opera house in Brownsville that was very successful, but it burned in 1932. And I said, aha, I'm going to weave that into my story. That's factual. And when I lived in Brownsville, Tennessee, there was a lady that lived next door to me who was in her 90s. Her name was Miss Elizabeth. And the, Miss Elizabeth would have been that age in, in the 1930s. And so Miss Elizabeth got married in a red dress. And I just love that story. So to pay tribute to Miss Elizabeth, I uh, wove that into one of the character stories as well. But otherwise, it's just all fiction. It's all my imagination. <laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, you got Henrietta, daughter of this wealthy Thomas and Lucille Dixon. The, the father commits suicide. You know, back in the day, and, and maybe still now, women don't have a lot of choices. So I, I knew I wanted to have this theme of these women empowering themselves with choices. But some of the choices that they make are not necessarily moral choices or legal choices, but it's because of what's going on in their lives. I mean, Henrietta herself is, is left pretty much destitute. That's his reasoning for committing suicide in part. The other part is this illegal business. And so Henrietta has to decide, am I going to rekindle this illegal business? She's not supposed to ever know about it, but she finds out about it. But she finds out that it could save her, you know, and keep her in her home and protect the people that are living with her that she's she's taken on as boarders. It's kind of like morality versus survival. What do I do? And and of course, there are consequences. And then how does she deal with the consequences? And then, of course, there's a love interest and there's a bad guy. And <laughs> but it's very human. You know, there's a lot of real emotion in it. And people that I've talked to that have read it identify with it in so many different ways. And that, to me, is very gratifying, you know, to know that other people understand that life is never easy, you know, but we do we do survive and we do make it, you know, so. She's but, a rich character. She really is. And then she dresses up like her father. She poses as a man. This woman's got real grit. She does. And there are times in the book where I think, how is she going to go on, you know, and, and I'd start writing and get to the end of the chapter. And I'm like, where did that come from? These people, what are they doing? <laughs> you know? So you just never know, you know, where the imagination is going to lead. I've done a lot of marketing via Instagram, Facebook, and what's really been most successful for me is holding book signings, to be honest with you. I'm getting some speaking engagements now, and I'm heading back up to Kentucky, where I'm from, doing a book signing and a book talk, and you can find me on Goodreads. So I'm um, getting reviews on Goodreads, getting reviews on Amazon. That seems to be what attracts people more than anything in terms of marketing is people are going to go and they're going to look and they're going to read the reviews and then decide for themselves. But mostly it's word of mouth. You know, I have a lot of folks that have said, Oh, I'm sharing this. And I've told, you know, so I think that's how it is with readers. A lot of times good books get passed on through, through friends who are also readers. That's right. Great work, Hannah, on your story and writers. I hope you were taking notes on the marketing. An ice age in 2030 threatens to wipe out the planet. Unable to go back in time to change human behavior to avoid extinction, scientists fly to the Andromeda galaxy and find 
Earth 2. They're transporting people to Earth 2 when the third book in Robert W. Stack's four-part series begins. The story comes from the mind of a man who was a professor and chair of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of Michigan. It is entitled The Andromeda Galaxy and Beyond. So what happens now? Two things. The people that are now on Earth 2 are exploring and they find out there are actually dinosaurs on Earth too. But the spaceship takes some people with them. And they travel around the Andromeda galaxy and they find other planets on which there's life. And so they uh, study the people on the various planets and find out that they're not that dissimilar from humans. We're back on Earth too. They have decided to set up their form of government and how they're going to run the planet. And they decide they want democratic socialist government. And instead of having a Congress, they have a parliament because parliaments tend to be more people oriented than a Congress is. And that's working very well. At the end, the original six let off the, uh, the other travelers and go back out and then come back about 250 years later and they decide to stay on the planet for the rest of their lives. However, after being on the planet for about 25 years or so, that's when they decide it's time to go back into space again. Do you and think that's it, what we need to do is just go to another planet and start over? <laughs> well, in the, the fourth book, the people go back and to Earth before the Ice Age is really full blast and they decide to take as many people as they can but they don't want to take them to earth too because it would be too disruptive so they do find another planet and take them and then they go into the future and earth too is doing very well and the new earth the people have fallen into their same attitudes that we have today and they're destroying their that planet bad habits die hard huh uh-huh and so it's it's a science fiction book but they're political statements i don't know if you ever watched the original star trek gene roddenberry had a lot of political emphasis in his writing for example in the 23rd century they didn't have money everybody was given what they needed didn't have to worry about buying anything mm. and i'm writing these books bringing up a lot of issues that people should become aware of it's interesting that you wrap <laughs> it up by basically you know if you don't learn from history we're doomed to repeat it and that's one of the big problems if you read mein kampf and you look at what Trump is doing and the attitude that Hitler had, he's doing the same things. What you do is you, you, you make everybody not trust your institutions so you can destroy the institutions. And what institutions has Trump picked on? The fourth estate, newspapers, they're fake news. They're all lies. If they say anything negative against me, it's all fake. He's took the Department of Justice and the FBI and basically said they're not trustworthy. Our uh, intelligence service, I don't believe them. I believe Putin and so forth. He's doing exactly the things that a guy by the name of Adolf Hitler did in the 1930s. All right. Interesting point of view, Robert. Thank you. E. Wayne Cundiff is a retired high school history teacher in Sacramento who's taken up hunting, drawing, and writing. A crime buff. He had a dream of writing a novel and explaining how people wind up the way they do. Is it nature, nurture, guidance, all of which he explores in his book entitled Lavender and Steel. It's a crime story about a professor who's um, quite irksome and irritable, but he's also very mild-mannered, even effeminate. And what nobody knows is that he leads a double life in the uh, decadent parts of town. He's a closet homosexual, and he um, associates with underage male prostitutes. And at one point, he... Uh, shoots and kills one of them. And so there are two other characters, it's actually me, a former student, trying to make peace with everything that's happened. And and the other is, and I use a lot of coincidence here, a childhood friend of mine who also, like 20 years later, befriends the victim as a, kind of an odd coincidence. Then, then there's a trial in the story and, and the aftermath and with the perpetrator going to prison and, and the former student trying to reach the, the professor and get him to 
be remorseful and, and you know repent for what you did for lack of a better term and that fails but yes it's, it was a gruesome story uh, again I, I it's a very reflective work when i get to the, the end of it you know i'm sitting there thinking and i'm looking at my five-year-old son and wondering you know what was i doing all the right things to bring him up right and and would he turn out all okay? And like I said, it's a lot of reflection, a lot of flashbacks to my childhood, to my college days, and, and into our modern times. So this is loosely based on some things that happened to you. Definitely childhood experiences, college experiences. And, you know, so I go back to like sixth grade, and that's where I meet up with my friend. And you know, he and I are both outcast to a, a certain degree. Part, you know, I was because of my, my weight, my obesity. He was because of his feminine nature. And, and, and also my childhood friend died from AIDS. I think the, the reader wants to take away um, a feeling of compassion, you know, obviously for the victim, even though the victim really isn't a likable person. You know, he's a well, juvenile delinquent and an over-racist, white supremacist. He's not a nice guy, but, you know, you feel some sympathy for him and, and maybe some sympathy for, for everybody involved in it. Some people are completely innocent, some are not, but, you know, I didn't want to sound vindictive. And also to have some sympathy for you know, we like to say people who take their wrong turns, and uh, to, to some extent it's um, a sub-theme, a sympathy for age victims. It's a little compassion would be nice. Even trying to draw compassion for people who are completely unlikable. Right. You know, that, that's a real challenge. You know, when I, when I was 14, the Charlie Manson murders occurred, and I remember feeling really mad and vindictive. And, but then over the years, I learned more about some of the characters, you know, Tex Watson, and, and some of them did repent and admit that what they did was horribly wrong, and and to say, you know, there's there's still some good in everybody, you know. And right. So I, I I just feel very strongly about that. And it's not an easy thing to do. But even that professor, he and I didn't get along, but, you know, I, I tried to find some good in him. So I've been on Facebook, hmm. but um, I taught at the same high school for 35 years. So when they found out about it, probably half the books I sold were people I work with or former students. Well, that's a start. Maybe go back and teach those students about compassion. We could all use a little of that, don't you think? James Griffin sells truck novelty license plates in North Carolina. Like a lot of parents, when his son was little, he wanted him to understand the real meaning of Christmas. You know, there are some who believe it's all about Jesus, others who believe it's all about Santa. So James decided to bring the two together in his book entitled The Christmas Miracle. It's basically a three-part book. The first part of it will tell you a portion of Jesus' life up till the crucifixion. The second part of the book will introduce Chris Kringle and his wife Jessica as Christian people who believe in Jesus and try to live their life, you know, right. And then the third part of the Jesus recognizes this in them as being good people, and he offers them an opportunity to share that with the world so basically jesus gives the opportunity for the santa claus figure to be born and spread the joy and the love what a nice way to tie these two things together you know because they both they both involve faith right you have to believe in something that's not really there that's correct and i my son is now 12 and i wrote it for him but yeah i had the idea for several years it was just an idea to write it and didn't really act on it, just kind of sat on it and it just kept nagging me. But, you know, now that he's a little older, you know, I try to instill in him that Christmas is, is it's just about the belief. It's about believing in something, that something good happens at Christmas, whether it be a Santa Claus figure, whether it be because you believe in, you know, in Jesus but it's just the fact of, of having something to believe in that gives you the hope that there is good in the world that comes from people. Oh, this is great. I believe it would be a great Christmas gift. I've had several people read the book. My son goes to a Christian school, and I actually got the administrator of the school to help me. You know, he steered me in the right direction. I didn't want to step on anyone's toes. I'm not trying to tell the church that this is what they should do. I mean, it's just a way to try to tie in both of these figures that you just simply have to believe in based on someone telling you about them. And I, I've not had anyone who did not like the book. Um, I'm supposed to go a little closer towards Christmas to the library for a reading. I'm in the process of trying to set up a Facebook page 
and all I'm really trying to do is just is get it out there. Well, this is the perfect time to do it, James, and the perfect time for a pause on the Page Publishing Book Club. Stay with us. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books, and unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them, and they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes store and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry or biography and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call for your free author submission kit. Call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. We are back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Dr. Jerome Carroll is an addiction counselor and he's written plenty on the subject of substance treatment. He was in charge of programs at Project Return and at 85, he's a volunteer at the Brooklyn VA helping vets deal with addiction. Now he provides a sort of roadmap in his book entitled Straight Talk about addiction, treatment, recovery, and achieving a better quality of life. I wanted to write a book that would be helpful to someone who was just entering treatment to give them an idea what to expect. And also to let their family know, because it's like all they know is their son or daughter or somebody is going into treatment. And I also think it is helpful to people who enter the treatment field for addiction, but their experience is very limited. So I wrote it to cover things like the factors that contribute to addiction, the different things that uh, programs do to kind of help the person in their recovery struggle and to help them learn more about things like relapse, because relapse, unfortunately, is a very common experience. So it was to provide and to give them a model to understand how both personal and environmental factors interact, both to get them in, caught up in addiction, as well as to understand how these elements need to be taken into account in the recovery process. And I wrote it as simple as possible, didn't use a lot of fancy stuff. And I think I did a pretty decent job of that. Unfortunately, nobody has a cure for addiction. You'd have to open the skull of somebody and root through billions of brain cells to remove those connected with their addiction. Nobody does that. There is no cure. However, it is possible for somebody to learn alternative ways of coping with problems and living, unsettling feelings, etc., without turning to drugs and alcohol. And it is also possible for people to improve the quality of their life, make their experience of living meaningful and purposeful, where they can live with dignity and self-respect, and they can be law-abiding, and they can reestablish relationships. But it takes a really good understanding and commitment over time because they have a disease, in quotes, that they'll take to the grave with them. So they always have to be alert and on guard. People with addiction, it affects their rational thinking. And so they often end up denying that they have problems or they can justify doing things that they normally wouldn't do. The the substances that they misuse has an effect on the brain. The brain is an electrochemical system. And if you put A into B, you change that to a new C. So a lot of people think uh, when they say, well, why don't you just stop using? They're not fully understanding that part of this is an organic chemical procedure that the person has no control over, which is then complicated by disruption of their rational thinking. It's a terrible disease to get, and it's life-threatening, but some people survive it, get past it, and go on to live very productive and positive lives. And I like to believe that under the right circumstances with the right kind of help 
and the person really making a commitment that uh, it is possible. Well, that's really good to hear, Dr. Carroll. We we all need hope. Dr. Keith Lloyd is an aircraft machinist in Fort Worth, Texas. As a result, it took him a couple of years to put his book together. It is entitled Easy Beliefism. He believes people are deceived by false teachings in the religious world that faith alone and salvation are what's going to save them, neither of which he says are taught in the Bible. Of course, you're familiar with verse uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the King James Version, which I grew up with. Well, the New International Version, which uh, changed the word from should to shall, so I started asking why. I got a Greek-English lexicon out and found out that it would have been a more appropriately translated into should. And I'm not an English major or anything, but to me, when someone tells me they should do something, when they say they shall do something, should means that they maybe won't, and shall means they would. And so I think they're using it to support the idea that all they have to do is believe in Jesus to be saved. and uh, That's not what the Bible teaches. So you felt compelled to... To try to point anybody that would would read it to the Bible to see that what it teaches is not what's being taught in the denominational world by many evangelical pre- uh, preachers. Uh, even Jesus himself said that not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the, my father who's in heaven. What that means is a lot of people on the day of judgment who are believers have been deceived by the devil, the, the greatest deceiver there is, and uh, led down the wrong path and will not get the reward they were hoping for. So you're trying to save them. Trying to open their eyes to the fact that what the Bible teaches is that we must obey him. And like Jesus said, you must do the will of the Father. And the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 5, 9, that Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who would obey him. There's obedience required as well. It's not just faith only. Well, you know, I, I can't even tell you how many people I talk to who interpret the Bible, who say that God came to them to deliver a message and they know what the Bible really says and they know what Jesus really means. So it makes it difficult, you know, for people who are really searching to know what to believe. Exactly. There's a lot of people out there that want to try to tell you they've had a revelation from God. The problem with that is that you now have to have faith in that person that they're telling you the truth. And we're told that Jesus is the only way we're going to be saved. It's only through him that we can have salvation. And so you have to have your faith in Christ and faith in God and not in some man's testimony. I use the book primarily to uh, end a conversation, I guess, with people that I never have time to end one with. Uh, I work around a bunch of guys and I've talked to them at different times about the Lord. And we're at work, we're on the clock, so we don't really have time to discuss the truth in detail. And I've pointed to them the biblical scriptures in this book that will help them find the truth if they really would like to, but just pointing to scriptures. I'm going to encourage people when I do uh, have the opportunity to speak to them that get a, get the copy of the book and review it. If you like it, then pass it on to somebody that won't listen to you. Oh, fair enough, D. Keith Lloyd. Thank you. Roman Masters buys and sells exotic classic cars, had a home improvement business in Delaware, and he's written for magazines like Gambling Times. Now he's written his first book. It's entitled For the Love of Tina, based on some aspects of his own life. Now, you call this a playful romantic novel. It depicts how a teenager's first love that ended before they could uh, reach consummation And because of that, how much it drastically affected them and how it changed their their lives because they always look back, especially the the character in the book, Cash Banfield. It really messed him up, and he was always, always searching to find Tina. Well, he, he cheated on her, right? Yes. He wasn't the instigator. It was her cousin, in fact. Uh, they went to a stable because she, he was getting her a job to work with some horses. And there was alone in the stable, and it wasn't his intentions. And Tina's cousin made the first move on him, and that was the first time that he was in a sexual relationship. And he's sorry that it happened, but yet, of course, he loved it because Tina always said that she's saving herself for him, and they did everything except the actual sexual act. And every time he would meet somebody, you see, that's the flaw in his character. All his life, he's searching to find the qualities of Tina in somebody else, in looks and, and, and personality. 
And he never could do that. Nobody could duplicate the passion that, that he felt for her. And because he's going out with so many different women, you know, he developed an addiction for exotic dancers. And he had everything, he said, except love. In other words, he found women that were beautiful and he cared for them, but he wasn't in love with them because still in the back of his mind, he wanted Tina. But he did find one girl which he cared for, but messed that up also. He does have a chance to get back with Tina and he kind of messes it up again. The moral is that it's real life and that even normal common people trying to find happiness in, in a simple way. And the point is love is so difficult to work out. But one of the best parts that I like about the book is at the end of every chapter, he writes a poem to describe what happened in the chapter. So there's a lot of poetry in the book, like 31 poems in there. And I believe that the poetry is absolutely fantastic. In my opinion, the book is its humorous. It's also very sexy. It's tongue in cheek. And even if you didn't like poetry, you would like the book very much. I've, I've gone to, I've started going to some uh, open mics in the area, especially there's a big one in Delray Beach called uh, Arts Garage. And I get a, a lot of good feedback on that, on, on my poetry. And I am, I am getting ready to open up a Facebook page uh, to describe my book. I want to do whatever I can. I'm just starting to do that to promote this book. Because you could write a good book, and if it sits on the shelf and nobody reads it, nobody knows it. Well, you got that right, Roman. Thank you. And thanks to all of the authors who joined us tonight. I hope you found some of their stories helpful, informative, inspiring, and thanks for being with us. If you missed anything, you know where to go. 710WOR.com and download the podcast. Do not miss an episode of the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. Thank you.